Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of the Green New York Lunchtime Learning Webinar Series. My name is Brendan Woodruff. I'm the Director of Sustainability at the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, and I'm happy to welcome you here today. Uh, we've got a great presentation on tap. I just want to get to a few housekeeping items before we get started today. The first one is, is that everyone is on mute upon entry. If you have questions as we go along today, please type them into the chat box. Any questions you have, type them into the chat box and we will get to them after the presentation. Uh, in addition, this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the Green New York website afterwards. I will put a link in the chat to that. So if you have colleagues that weren't able to make it or you want to go back and check on something after the fact, uh, you're more than welcome to do that on the Green New York website. In addition, our next webinar is going to be on Tuesday, March 14th. It's going to be on greener cookware. So thinking about things that you're using on your stove uh, and other uh, baking accoutrements. Um, so I'll put a link to the chat in there as well for the registration to that. Again, that's a greener cookware on Tuesday, March 14th. Um, and so without further ado, we've got an absolutely fantastic presentation today that I think is at the intersection of a lot of things that we've been talking about on this series, uh, kind of wraps together very nicely what folks can do and the work that the state is doing to empower folks uh, from disadvantaged communities and other backgrounds on taking control of their energy costs in future and being able to be part of the solution in lowering emissions. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Matt Caruso from NIPA. Hi, Matt. Hey, thanks, Brendan. I appreciate uh, taking the time for allowing me to make this presentation to everyone. And I'm very excited that I get to offer this opportunity and get to speak to you all about our environmental justice department and our weatherization workshops as well. Um, so, Brendan, am I able to control the slides, or should I just say next slide when whenever we're ready? You are able to control the slides, and if oh, you could fantastic. get a little closer to your mic too, we've had a couple comments here from folks saying that uh, they're having a little trouble hearing. Okay, is that better? Uh, it's a little muffled still. Okay, let me see. You guys hear me better now? Yep, there it is. <laughs> okay, awesome. Apologies. Sorry about that. Um, but yeah, let's get started. So my name is... Oh, actually, Brenda, it doesn't look like I have control over moving the slides. Yep, just let me know. And, oh, wait. Yep. Yep. You should be good to go now. Great, thank you very much. So just a quick background, I uh, just wanted to give a little bit of an overview of the New York Power Authority. Um, I'm sure a lot of folks on this call probably do know who we are, but if not, then just a quick minute run through here. So our mission is to really lead the transition to a carbon-free, economically vibrant New York through customer partnerships, innovative energy solutions, and of course, being responsible suppliers and afford, uh, being able to uh, supply uh, reliable, affordable, and clean electricity to all New York State uh, residents. Uh, NIPA is the largest state public utility uh, in the nation. We operate 16 generating facilities with more than 1,400 circuit miles worth of transmission throughout all of New York State. Uh, more than 40, oh, excuse me, more than 80 percent of uh, our electricity is produced by clean renewable hydropower. Uh, we have two very large hydro facilities, one in Niagara Falls and the other one in Messina by the St. Lawrence River. Uh, NIPA uses no tax money or state credit, uh, if, and, and it finances its operations through the sales of bonds and revenues earned in large part through our sales of electricity. So that being said, I do want to just give a quick overview about our environmental justice department and some of the programs that we offer statewide to our stakeholders. So uh, we're really driven by the uh, commitment of always being a good neighbor to those historically disadvantaged communities, and these are really low. These are communities. Historically, that are deemed environmental justice uh, areas by the DEC, as well as disadvantaged communities deemed by NYSERDA. Um, and these are we focus on the community uh, that have been host for NIPA's assets for years, host to our gener generating facilities for years, and we want to make sure that we're giving back and leveraging our expertise in energy and technology to provide no cost programs and services that meet the unique needs of these communities and their residents. One program I'm going to go that I'm going to go over in particular today is our energy education and weatherization workshops for adult energy literacy. So with this workshop, we really want to make sure that we're supporting community energy literacy for adults from all backgrounds, whether it's you're a homeowner, a renter, a new American refugee, or someone that's been in 
uh, New York for many, many years now. Uh, we really want to really help alleviate high energy burden to all walks of life, all people coming from all different types of backgrounds, but also focusing on those low to moderate income families that face this at a higher rate. Uh, we, we provide simple or renter friendly demonstrations that don't require tools. Uh, when we host these workshops, we even bring props. You can see on the screen here, I have a picture of our photo prop uh, working with a resident to install a plastic film over the window for to weatherize the window. And I got a really great video that'll show everyone how to do that later on in this presentation as well. Uh, we also give out um, many different uh, other props and kits that go along with our presentation, and I'm going to describe those in the upcoming slides as well. And all of our workshops that we host um, here at EJ for our stakeholders are free for the organization, free for the participants to attend. Um, for this workshop in particular, they, each resident comes home with a weatherization kit filled with many of the things that we go over during the workshop itself. So the kit includes a couple things, um, whether it's plastic film, uh, door caulking, weather, uh, window caulking, light bulbs, smart strips, you name it. We want to make sure that we're, we're providing these, these cost effective uh, applications so that residents can go home and start to see uh, uh, impacts on the utility bills without having to compromise comfort and safety. Uh, some of the stakeholders that we've um, some of the stakeholders that we've included here on the screen here are kind of the main stakeholders that we've been hosting these workshops with, but it's definitely not limited to. We've been quite creative when it comes to hosting some of these workshops statewide, uh, but the but the ones that we've been seeing that have been having a really great impact on their residents have been the refugees and immigrant centers, uh, religious organizations. We've had great success hosting these workshops at public libraries, as well as senior centers. Uh, we've also partnered with a handful of different community-based organizations, especially ones that have uh, that are really driven with community engagement and community advocacy, as well as hosting these workshops with housing authorities where residents pay their own utilities. So uh, before I get started here, I'm going to just give a quick overview of what our workshops look like and how they kind of help and the uh, next slides over I, mean, I am going to give kind of a sneak peek of what it looks like to attend one of our workshops and go over the heating uh, section of our workshop so a quick overview here our workshops really do uh, intend to teach low to no cost ways to conserve energy and lower utility bills while improving comfort um, everything that we go over in, within the workshop is something simply that can be done uh, with really without tools. Uh, a lot of it is more behavioral. Uh, we point out things like uh, something uh, whereas maybe it's turning off the lights and closing doors and un unoccupied spaces or uh, setting the thermostats to a proper setting. Uh, so we want to really bring those more behavioral aspects to life and create almost like a kind of like an energy saving plan with residents that they can go home with and start to implement in their own homes and apartments. Um, it features interactive hands on learning. So, like I said before, we have a number of props that we bring and we really get the residents involved with these props. We want to make sure that they, they get that hands on experience doing what we're saying uh, so that when they go home to their own homes and apartments, uh, they take what they learned in the workshop and do it on their own windows, their own doors, uh, being able to switch their own light bulbs without having to worry about if they're doing it incorrectly or not. So, something like that is very, very important to us. Uh, the workshops themselves really are anywhere from about an hour to an hour and a half. Um, and that really depends on how many questions we get. Sometimes we get tons of questions and we're there for a very long time, um, which is fantastic. I always welcome more questions because uh, it always helps. It's always helpful for us to come back and uh, see what type of questions people have. And if we can answer them, uh, we will in person. If not, then I always make it an effort to follow up with people after the workshop to try and provide as many answers as I can for their questions. Uh, we provide food. A lot of the times we found that these workshops are more accessible to adults and seniors when it's held after work hours or on the weekends. And the last thing we want to do is really make it any more stressful for adults, especially if they are coming straight from work uh, and they don't want, we don't want them to worry about if they're going to stop and grab a meal. Uh, we provide a hot meal at every single one of these workshops. Um, and I had mentioned this before, participants receive a free weatherization kit, and it also comes with a step-by-step -step in installation manual at the end of the workshop. So the step-by-step -step has pictures with instructions that really outlines pretty much everything that you get inside the kit and how to install it in your own home and apartment properly. So what's inside the kit, right? 
So we give out a handful of different things here that you could see in the screen, uh, consisting all the way from tube caulking for the doors and windows, uh, LED night lights and light bulbs, uh, door sweeps that self of here, um, hot water gauges, shrink wrap for the windows, uh, weather stripping uh, for the doors and windows as well. We also give out a fridge thermometer as well as a smart power strip, uh, which have been one of the very, very hot items that we've been seeing a lot of residents asking us for because they want to take more control over their entertainment and computer systems and make sure that they're not wasting any electricity when it comes to those appliances as well. So our workshop topics, we have five main ones that we go over each and every single workshop. Uh, the one that we start to interchange depending on the season is heating and cooling. This is where we really break out our hands-on activities. Uh, the one that's been a really great hit is the window prop when, we're, when we pretty much help residents and uh, help them understand how to properly uh, apply the weather, the, the weather stripping as well as the plastic film. So they get that hands-on experience putting it on the window, using a hairdryer, seeing what it looks like, how it's done properly. Um, so they can, when they go home and they want to break out the kit and take out the window film and do it with maybe a loved one or a child or a neighbor, uh, they could uh, teach by example and know that they're doing it the right way as well. Uh, we go over water conservation appliances, uh, mainly more smart appliances and how to make uh, appropriate choices if you're in, in the field for looking for new appliances for your home or apartment. Um, lighting, again, uh, making those smart lighting choices, switching to LEDs, how to be more energy conscious when, turn, when it comes off the turning lights off in certain rooms. Um, and then at the end of the workshop, we want to make sure that we provide a number of different resources that they could uh, take into account if they want to take the extra step, maybe get a home energy audit to see how their houses are, or, uh, are operating, how energy efficient they are. Uh, the next steps, if they want to reach out to uh, energy contractor to get any work done. So we, we always highlight the different programs that the Weatherization Assistance Program has in these certain regions, as well as the NESERTA Home Performance uh, Programs as well. So first, when we start our conversation, when it comes to heating and cooling, the first thing I always address when it comes to uh, the audience is air drafts, right? Because when it comes to, uh, especially with the cooler months, when we're so when it starts to get really, really cold outside, we're going to have that difference in pressure coming from the outside of your home to the inside of your home. And that difference of pressure really starts to push all that warm, hot air that you're paying really good money for. And it's starting to, you're starting to get all that cold air seeping from the bottom of your home, uh, from anything like a crack in the wall, an open window, an uninsulated uh, wall outlet. Uh, from the basement, maybe there's uh, no insulation. So these are all things that I like to address and make, like to make the audience aware of is really how how all that cold air is getting into your home from the difference of the outside pressure from it being really cold outside and then really hot inside. And then unfortunately it gets all that hot air pushed up really, really high. Um, I always like to use the analogy of uh, when folks take a shower in the morning. I think this is always a really big hit. People start to laugh at this one. But if you're ever taking a shower in the morning and you got the hot water really, really high, uh, you could start to see that the, the bottom of the shower curtain starts to attack you, right? And that's really because that all that cold air from the bathroom is getting sucked in through the bottom of that curtain because of the, the pressure difference in that uh, from all the hot air, from being from all the steam coming from that from that water. It's essentially the same type of process here when it comes to the stack effect into air drafts. You're getting all that really cold air being pulled inside to your homes and apartments due to uh, faults or cracks or insulation, uh, things like that. Um, and it's really pushing out all that really hot air that you're paying really great money for. And we're going we're gonna to address a couple of things that are going to really uh, be very simple, no cost ways to make sure that you're really using the most bang for your buck when it comes to your heating and heating seasons this year. So there are a lot of do it yourself actions when it comes to reducing drafts. Uh, some of the common ones is the ones that you'll see on the screen here, uh, using caulk for interior cracks or spray foam. Uh, when it comes to interior cracks, uh, I always like to say anything from about maybe like an eighth to a quarter or something that you could really address with a uh, interior kind of caulking. Um, anything over a quarter, or if you're even starting to get to like a half inch or something like that, that's when you're going to want to use something like a spray foam um, that's more expandable. Uh, if it's more than half an inch, getting to an inch or so, uh, that's usually when you want to start uh, applying things like uh, 
like some type of uh, drywall or insulation on top of that as well, um, because those holes are just way too big to cover up with caulking or spray foam. Uh, making sure that your windows are securely latched. And I think this is one that everyone kind of goes right over their heads, right? Uh, even when you close the window, uh, say, say, and uh, I'm going to test everyone to go home today and look at their own windows when they left this when they left this morning. Or if you're working from home right now, just taking a quick look throughout your room. Um, if your window is closed and you haven't latched that little security latch that you're going to see on top of the window when you uh, when you close it through the frames, your window is still technically open. If you have that latch open and it's not uh, securely locked, uh, it's not creating that barrier that cre uh, that pretty much comes about when you close that latch. Um, and without that latch being closed, you're still getting a lot of air seeping through in between the window panes, um, which is essentially just as good as an open window. So making sure that you're going around and make, uh, closing all those window frames, making sure they're securely latched uh, is going to be uh, a big saver when it comes to um, keeping and retaining all that hot air that you're hot heat that you're paying good money for. Uh, there's things like weather, weather stripping and rope caulking for drafty windows. Uh, this is really great if it's uh, for kind of wood to wood windows, because sometimes when you close a wood to wood window, you'll get like a hairline crack uh, and it never really closes fully. So you could put weather stripping on some of these older windows, which are the older wooden windows between where the, the window pane uh, panel and the window frame itself kind of closes on. Um, but for things like rope caulking, uh, those are really great for some of these newer windows, uh, more like vinyl and uh, plastic windows, uh, where if there's a crack along the window frame, uh, kind of almost looks like a putty, like something uh, maybe one of the kids at home are playing with. And you could pretty much put that on any of the cracks that you have on your window frame. Um, and come the springtime, if you want to remove it, you can just pick it with your finger and it comes right off. Um, you can install things like plastic sheeting for windows. This is definitely more of a, a wintertime thing. I would not recommend doing this during the summertime if you're looking to keep uh, cold air in. There are some of these applications you could do for the heating months that work well for the summer months. Um, but this one in particular, I would not recommend doing during the summer. This is definitely more of a wintertime thing. Uh, the best way to really make sure that you're using all the window uh, film uh, in your kit and get the biggest bang for your buck is uh, addressing the really drafty windows first. So if you ever take a walk around your home or apartment or maybe you're sitting on the couch and you can feel a draft coming from the couch, you want to make sure that you're attacking those windows first that are super drafty. You're not going to just don't go around and start putting up window film on all your windows because that'll make it way too stuffy and could get, could get quite dangerous if you did that in your home. Um, make sure you're go around take a quick lap in your home or apartment see which windows are uh, really drafty and take care of those first I'm, I'm sure you'll see a huge difference after you do that and then you can install things like uh, like sweeps uh, and also weather stripping on doors uh, they do make more of a permanent one if you're looking for more permanent solutions for for weather stripping on doors uh, where it comes with like an aluminum backing and it has kind of like a rubber uh, stop for where the door would pretty much close on it um, as well as the uh, sweeps as well they make more of a permanent solution for that as well as opposed to something that's a self uh, self-adhesive or uh, kind of like a stick-on uh, again they make ones that drill right into the bottom of the door or they're magnetic or uh, even slide right onto the bottom as well um, and installing gaskets on wall outlets and light switches uh, more importantly uh, installing those little foam kind of backings underneath the gaskets for the wall outlets because uh, essentially all these outlets are are holes in your wall right so if there are, isn't insulation on the, in any of these uh, gaskets on the wall, uh, you're looking at a bunch of maybe two or three inch holes, and may, depending on how many outlets you have in your wall, maybe 10 to 15. If none of those are insulated, those are probably going to add up to anywhere from 10 to 15 percent of the air drafts coming into your home. Uh, so making sure that all those gaskets on the wall and the, uh, for lights and switches and things of that nature are properly insulated. Uh, maybe if there was an electrician that came by and drilled or a plumber that came by and drilled piping for for sink or some type of cable or what have you, making sure that those holes are properly insulated as well because uh, we want to really minimize the amount. Yes, exactly. Gaskets, the covers, same thing. Yeah, they're, they're interchangeable. Exactly, Jennifer. Um, but making so they, they sell pretty much foam kind of covers that go underneath the uh, outlet covers and things of that nature. Uh, to prop make sure that they're properly insulated as well. How do you prevent garage door drafts? That's a good question. 
Uh, so I think it really depends on uh, if the garage door has any weather stripping on the bottom of it. I think there's a lot of them that nowadays they do come with it. If not, then I'm pretty sure you could do that same type of application where you would run kind of like a weather stripping on the bottom of the door to make sure that there's no kind of like hairline cracks from when the door closes on the on their uh, on your drive on your driveway or things of that nature. Um, that's actually one of the first times I've gotten that question, and uh, I'm thinking that might be one of the things I'm going to have to look up and get a better answer for you. But I'm I'm almost certain that you could just use something like a weather stripping, similar to how you would put it on the doors and the windows, and put it on the bottom of the garage door to get a tighter seal to make sure that there's no air coming back and forth. So I'm going to move along here. So I do have a quick video here. Um, hoping there's going to be sound here. Uh, Brendan, am I able to show this video? Uh, you can see if it'll work. I'm not sure. Let's see. Doesn't look like it's, it just looks like a picture. Mm, okay. Um, well, I guess if, if we're not able to get this video, I could always, um, I guess after this call, share it with Brendan. And there, I know there's another video on here that I wanted to show as well. I could share that as well. Uh, if, if folks wanted to take the time to watch the videos after this, but um, it's essentially, if anybody remembers uh, this old house, uh, it's a great video. We like to use a lot of their information. Uh, they do a great job pretty much demonstrating all the things that we're talking about today. Um, and this is a video kind of talking about air sealing and weather stripping for doors and windows. Um, I'm seeing a couple questions here in the chat here for plumbers never really seem to seal around pipes where they go into walls, especially under sinks. I assume it was safe. It wasn't safe to seal these holes. If it is, is there a better choice for sealing the gap? Yeah. So for something like that, you'd want to, um, use kind of like a, like a expanding spray foam. There's stuff called like great stuff that make, they make different types of, uh, products for it. They have interior, they have exterior, they have for plumbing and electrical. Um, and all that stuff is really sell at your local hardware store, like a Home Depot or Lowe's. Um, I would, uh, when you go to your local hardware store, kind of just let them know the area that you're looking to insulate, and they'll bring you right to the proper uh, spray foam to prevent that from happening. Yeah, so when it comes to preventing drafts, uh, again, from the exhaust fan over the stove, uh, usually you want to make sure that it's the area where you're kind of creating that hole to put that fan in. Um, and it's, again, it's similar to what, uh, the other thing, uh, that Heather was uh, talking about providing, uh, getting a spray foam. I would, I would recommend getting a professional to do that. Um, especially cause we're talking about exhaust fans. You would never want to mess that up. Um, uh, but again, a professional should be able to come by spray around the fan to make sure that it's, uh, that the hole that you pretty much cut to put the fan in is properly insulated. So there are some additional items that you can use to identify air leaks. Uh, some of these common ones that you see on the screen are very uh, commonly used when it comes to home energy audits and what energy contractors use. Uh, you'll, so you'll see on the left here, we have a, pretty much an infrared laser, a laser thermometer. Um, these laser thermometers are uh, really great when they're using them during audits because you can kind of see where the lack of insulation in your home is. So uh, energy contractor, we use this laser and run it along the wall yeah, exactly, Caroline. Yeah, this old house has tons of great videos. Um, oh, they do have one on garage door ceiling. That's fantastic. So, yeah, hon honestly, whenever I kind of get stumped with one of these weather station questions, I go back to this old house, and there's definitely a video for something like that. Um, but back to some, like, and they also have some other really great uh, kind of really great tools and information for how to better address leaks. But these are the two main ones that I've been uh, uh, using and seeing uh, from an energy contractor's perspective. Uh, so the laser thermometer, re again, really great for identifying if there's any lack of insulation in walls. Uh, they'll, what they'll do is they'll pretty much run it along the walls, uh, start to see if there's any temperature drops. This could be maybe where that's where they're running uh, piping or plumbing, uh, any electrical that was done after the, the walls were uh, installed, things of that nature. Uh, so you kind of get an idea uh, for, and this is definitely more for existing wall, existing, uh, excuse me, kind of exterior walls. Uh, so you'll get a good, really good idea of where there may be a lack of insulation. Uh, smoke pencils are really great too. 
because those are uh, tools that you could use to see where if there's any drafts from doors and window frames. Um, it's a pretty much a handheld tool that releases a vapor um, that isn't toxic and the vapor will pretty much be sucked out if you were to run it out along like a window frame or a door frame. If the vapor gets sucked outside from the uh, from inside to going to outside, uh, it's a really good indication that there's a either some type of leak or maybe a, uh, a crack or some uh, something just something wrong within the door frame and the window frame. Uh, I would I would highly recommend if you haven't already to get a smoke pencil. They're very very cheap, anywhere from like ten to fifteen dollars. Uh, if you don't want to use a smoke pencil, I mean, there are there's some other kind of other alternatives you can go with, whether it's a candle or an incense stick. Um, I've also had people tell me that you could use pretty much a piece of paper. Uh, and if you start to feel the paper to flap when you put it by the window frame or door frame, there's usually a good indication that there's a draft there. Uh, but the smoke pencil is a really great product. Um, it's very inexpensive and it gives you a great idea where uh, different um, cracks and leaks are in your home. So this was another video I wanted to show, uh, kind of showing how to weatherize your window properly. But I don't think we're going to get a chance to view this today, and I apologize. I could always, um, Brendan, after this call, I could definitely send you the two links for this video and uh, share it along with the rest of the attendee list here. Yeah, that sounds good. We can get those out to anybody who would like them. Sure. Um, so moving on here, again, I kind of mentioned this, mentioned this before. Uh, these are starting to talk about more of the behavioral things that we do with, with the audience when they attend. And we start to talk about things like thermostats, right? Of, of course, we want to always make sure that no one's got, or hopefully not, uh, has the thermostat that's installed on your, your left-hand side of the screen with the green background. Uh, those are some of the older mercury thermostats that aren't programmable. Uh, these are usually a very, very large energy hogs. Um, it doesn't give you much control over how much uh, how much uh, energy efficiency you get during your heating season, right? Uh, towards the right hand side of the screen, with kind of this beige background, uh, you start to see more of the, these programmable thermostats um, that are really fantastic. They aren't therm smart thermostats yet, which we'll get into, but at least the programmable thermostat will give you a little bit more advantage over uh, how to properly program your 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 heating to come up at certain time, go off at certain times, uh, which gives you a whole lot more uh, control over your energy efficiency levels in the house. So when it comes to pretty much uh, energy uh, actions for thermostats, I always like to recommend installing a programmable or smart thermostat, especially the smart thermostats too. Nowadays, they're very, very simple to install. Um, and usually any thermostat is very, very simple to install. They all pretty much have color-coded wires that you plug right into the thermostat when you when you first take it out of the box. Um, smart thermostats all come with, with apps that can connect right to your phone, uh, so you get a whole lot more control over uh, the heating and cooling seasons at your home. Uh, you could pretty much set up schedules. They come out with eco-friendly recommendations. Um, so that right there gives you a great uh, kind of insight on how to be more energy conscious in the home. I always like to recommend that if you can, use the lowest com your lowest comfortable temperature setting. Now, I'm not telling everyone to go home and put the thermostat to 50, but try fit, if, try 65, try try 64, try 63 when you're sleeping, um, something like that. Uh, so I'm just reading the comment that Laura had here, and exactly, I was going to get right to that. So I see that you say turn down the thermostat when you're not home. Does it take more energy to increase temperature than it does to keep the stable, to stable lowest comfortable setting? setting? So that's a good question. So your question is, does it take more energy to increase temperature than it does to keep a stable lowest comfortable temperature setting and i would say yes uh when if you're keeping it at kind of a consistent level when you're not home so i think the best way to kind of talk about this is with my photo on the next slide here right because this is kind of what we're hinting at so if you were to keep your thermostat at the same setting uh, in the mornings and evenings uh daytime hours maybe when you're work or at school or if you're sleeping you can kind of see that we're having 72 degrees across the board, right? And this is for if you were not to touch the thermostat whatsoever. Uh, if, and if uh, we were to try me maybe do a little bit of some increase, uh, decreases with some new temperatures. Uh, so let's say we want to scale it back from 72 to 68 in the mornings and evenings, right? And that's a difference of four degrees. 
uh, when we're not home, that, that I think to answer kind of your question here, the daytime hours, whether you're at work or at school. So if you were to lower uh, the thermostat when you're at home, nothing too low, and you're not, don't, I wouldn't recommend going anything lower than, than really 60 because uh, you want to make sure that you want to leave enough for it to come back up to, and you, we'll get to this in this next kind of point here uh, where it's not too big of a jump, right? Because when it's too big of a jump from like 60 to 68, that's when you're going to be using a lot of energy to go from uh, a low setting to a high setting. If you go from like 60 to 63 to 64, you're not having your 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 heating system work as hard to do that temperature jump because you're doing it in kind of smaller increments. Um, so for the nighttime hours, going from a 72 to 64, that's a eight kind of degree difference, right? So we're going to add all these degrees up. You can see here we're getting pretty much 24 degrees. Uh, so if we were to take that converted to a percentage, that's about 24% of a, of a savings that we're seeing from just switching the thermostat. We haven't done anything that's that requires a tool or what have you. We're simply just turning the thermostat down slightly, right? And if we were to have an estimated cost uh, for one heating season, let's say about $1,000, if we were to take that and times that by 24%, just by simply turning the thermostat down to a little bit of a lower setting, something that you're more that you could deal with that's not too low but somewhat still bearable, uh, and a little still a little more comfortable, you'll see a direct savings. And you can see on the chart here, um, we're at, on an average kind of saving two hundred and forty dollars, right? Um, so if you wanted to do this at your own home at your own time, uh, just going around seeing kind of like what your current temperature is, uh, maybe suggesting some new ones. Uh, taking that and converting it into a percentage, uh, seeing what your average is for one heating season, and then times times that and see what your savings is. Uh, $240 can go a very long way. I, I think something like this really hits home for me when I'm doing this presentation statewide uh, because we want to make sure that uh, we kind of show some more alternatives for folks to save save on money, and the, the money that they're saving from something just as simple as turning the thermostat down can be used to buying something like groceries or medical supplies or school supplies for a loved one. Uh, so something as simple as this can really see a direct impact on your utility bills. So kind of just wrapping things up here. Uh, the, our major goals here for these workshops when we host them statewide are to, again, really to identify the biggest energy users in your home or apartment. Uh, we try our best to really answer any questions folks have. I uh, always love that when we get uh, some more, more people from the crowd to support our answers and give out more suggestions as well. Uh, again, thank you, Caroline, for posting that video. I'm definitely going to take a look at it myself after this call. Um, identify actions that you could take on your own time. And again, to develop an action plan. Uh, again, we, we always, when we do these workshops, we like to tell folks to kind of bite off what they can uh, uh, at once, not to be the weekend warrior and do everything all in one shot. Maybe start with the thermostat lowering, see how you feel. And then if you're comfortable with that, maybe do something like switching to LEDs and you're step by step making more of these changes to your home or apartment and you're gradually starting to see uh, your energy bills get lower, your comfort get uh, uh, your comfort level increase without even having to compromise on safety. Um, so see, so again, when we wrap everything up, are there any LED that you would recommend? Um, so we actually do give one out in our kits. Hold on one second. I can just grab that real quick. Go ahead on me. And I'll, I'll just kind of jump in here as well. Um, do you have any resources on NIPA's website, or do you know if NYSERDA has any revolving around kind of the quality of LEDs or what people might be looking for? Uh, we try and go more towards, you know, general specifications and things rather than specific uh, companies. Yeah, I mean, I don't think NIPA per se has um, any kind of information on itself about LEDs, uh, especially when it comes to kind of the residential ones. Um, I mean, typically you want to get an LED uh that has anywhere from uh, i mean nowadays they make them very very pretty much low we're, we're like thinking like anywhere from like nine to ten watts here uh i mean the older incandescent ones were using something like 60 right uh so i would say i mean phillips makes a great led bulb they are very like uh always very energy efficient um I, I, but i would recommend uh if you want to be more energy conscious and you want to take the extra step 
to pick, make sure you're picking a bulb with a, a low wattage. Um, and of course, if you want to take into things like lumens too, lumens is going to pretty much be your kind of example for how it illuminates the room. Um, but uh, again, you're going to see really not much of a difference um, anywhere for those lower wattages when they're going to really bright, uh, brighten up the space and not have to worry about um, the super increase on your energy bill like the old uh, incandescent ones would have. Um, so I'm seeing here, yeah, and I, I mean, I'm sure if you were to go to your local utility, uh, Con Ed, I'm sure has uh, information on their website about for, about LEDs or light bulbs in general. I'm sure National Grid has the same thing too. Um, and I know nowadays they're even starting to give out some of this information in the kind of those mailers that everyone's receiving at home. So, uh, so don't throw out those mailers. They may have some really great information uh, about any uh, at home energy efficiency upgrades that you could do. Um, but yeah, you could also go to a Walmart too. Walmart's got all these products on their shelves. Something like a Home Depot or Lowe's will have all these products on their shelves as well. Um, yeah, and we can get to the rest of the questions in a second here, Matt. Sure. Wrap up. Yeah, no, just wrapping up here. Just uh, on the screen here, you'll see some of the the home energy resources that New York State provides for their residents. Uh, the one of the two of the biggest ones that I have on the screen here, of course, are the Weatherization Assistance Program. Uh, they work in vet contractors on a regional basis to that perform uh, pretty much everything that we were talking about today, from the energy audits to the providing the reports to uh, doing the uh, weatherization and energy efficiency upgrades. Uh, and I sort of does the same thing. They partner with uh, Home Performance with Energy Star, and again, we'll uh, vet and work with contracts contractors statewide to provide these resources to homeowners uh, on um, kind of a home income base level. Uh, a lot of the times, depending on your home, uh, your home uh, income base, you'll be able to receive uh, home energy audit for free or half off. And when it comes to the work itself, again, depending on your home income base, uh, get anywhere from uh, some of the work to be done on a slight, a slight less scale, half off to even free. Let's click next slide here. So. Uh, it's really simple to partner with us if anybody on this call has a, a stakeholder or an organization in mind that they want to reach out to us about and uh, see if they'd be interested in hosting us. It's simply just giving us a quick email at our at our email here that's on the screen, which is environmental.justice at nightbot.gov. Uh, we'll take care of coordinating the date and time um, and work with the stakeholder on the location for the workshop. Uh, we have flyers in-house that we could share that the, that the stakeholder could use to promote and register guests. Um, and simply, I think the best way to put this is, uh, as long as there's a space with people, we'll bring everything else to educate the people. Um, so we could do everything, uh, from buying the food, bringing the, the educator, bringing the kits, uh, and just work with the people in these great neighborhoods that we want to share this information with. Uh, so that's really it. And again, thank you, Brendan, for giving me the time to present to everyone today. Uh, I apologize that the videos weren't working, but I could definitely share those after this call. Thanks, Matt. That was fantastic. And I think that um, kind of hit the sweet spot of some really good tips for folks to be able to uh, do in their own life and also learn about a fantastic program that you and the team over at NIPA are doing. And I just want to say thank you, uh, you know, from everybody here for doing that work um, and helping people save money and become more energy literate. So the first question I've got here for you is um, when you do these um, these seminars, what do you find people are most interested in to learn when it comes to energy literacy, or do you see certain areas where more education is needed than others? Uh, I would say the, the, the heating and cooling part of our presentation is definitely where people are asking us the most questions and most interested on, especially when it comes to uh, air sealing. Uh, I mean, New York state is a cold climate state. We do a lot of these workshops in areas like Utica and Albany, Messina, uh, Buffalo, Niagara Falls, you name it. Um, and they're all areas where that can get extremely cold during the winter seasons. Um, especially we saw last, uh, last year, Western New York was hit with tons of snow and they got a bunch of really frigid cold days. And, uh, we were getting a lot of 
folks coming asking us to provide these workshops for their residents and and we did and uh, a lot of the questions that we were asking was how they can how to weatherize their windows and doors to keep them to keep them warm during the winter um how, what resources are there uh, out there if they needed to get things like a boiler or a heating system uh, upgrades so if they're elderly if they're over 65 who do i reach out to so uh, we 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 were working diligently with some of these uh residents to provide that information and um do our best to connect them to the right resources if they if they didn't know of the resources that existed out there already. Mm -hmm. And another question here um, is, do you have any numbers or data on how much folks are saving after your uh, seminars? Do you do any kind of follow up surveys or checking with folks to see if they're sticking with the tips? So, unfortunately, I, I don't have uh, the authority to do that um, I, and the, the power authority doesn't have residential customers. Uh, so, these workshops are strictly just meant to be educational and provide this knowledge um, uh, through a workshop setting. Um, the only kind of information I take down is uh, we, get, we do give out a survey at the end of the, the workshop and we just ask people to fill out their experience and what they would like to see us uh, uh, continue to expand on. Um, but I, I, I don't keep any one's uh, email information. Uh, I make it very well known in the beginning of these workshops that they're strictly educational, that uh, we're not signing anybody up for any types of programs, and we want them to make sure that they're comfortable with that because a lot of times when we, uh, when folks come to these communities, they're saying something just similar to like that, right? And they're then get, uh, having uh, these residents provide their phone numbers and emails addresses, and then out of nowhere, they're signed up for four or five programs that the resident didn't want. Um, so yeah. we, we want to make sure that they're comfortable with us coming in and we're able to provide this information at a, at a high level. Um, but again, uh, I've always found that we've had a lot of stakeholders reach out to us and do these um, pretty much on a reoccurring basis. Uh, so there's been a handful of times where um, I've come in and worked with a stakeholder a number of times and working with some of the same residents too, just kind of like re-educating them on some of the tips and tricks that we teach about. Um, but yep, to your point, no, uh, we're not able to ask um, about utility savings and things of that nature. I, I wish yeah. we could, but unfortunately it's not. Yeah, no, that, that makes complete sense, uh, the way that the program is structured. So one other question here, we've heard a lot about ventilation in the last three years with uh, COVID and um, everything else. When you're doing a lot of this, it's kind of home sealing with the tips. Um, are there any kind of tips or tricks you have on ventilation versus efficiency? I'm thinking about like weather stripping and plastic over the windows and things if folks are, you know, are there any concerns about sealing it too tight? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the point I was making before, right? Where it, if you are looking to air seal, make sure you, you're air sealing your doors and windows that are the most leaky ones or most drafty ones, right? Just don't go around and start air sealing everything in the home uh, because then that's, of course, when you'll start to see things like uh, like humidity and uh, start to get really stuffy and uh, even start to cause things like like mold, depending on if there's any water inside the house or water damage that, that prior that you didn't know about. So, um, again, yeah, when it comes to uh, air sealing, definitely focus on the areas that uh, are most drafty, uh, where you feel most cold around. Um, and if that, after you do those applications, if you still don't feel a difference, then uh, I would recommend reaching out to a local energy auditor, have them come by and do a home energy assessment because it could be something. Uh, more than your windows and doors. Mm -hmm. So we've got a couple questions here too about standard insulation. So there's different kinds out there. There's spray foam. There's um, kind of the the regular blocks of it that you see. Um, do you ever get into that or have any recommendations for folks in terms of what the right kind of insulation is or what works best? Yeah. So I mean, I know um, for New York State, especially in our cold uh, weather climate here, uh, we've been seeing a lot of um, energy orders using cellulose insulation. It's very easy to uh, install in people's homes and in people's walls. Um, a lot of times it's because uh, we live in, especially when it comes to New York City, uh, a lot of these are pre-war buildings, very old buildings uh, where insulation probably wasn't installed or was installed poorly. Uh, so they're able to pretty much cut uh, circular holes into the wall, pump, put a pump into the wall and pretty much uh, put it, spray in, uh, what's it called, cellulose, which is pretty much cut up packing uh, newspaper and paper products with, uh, of course, other types of, uh, uh, chemicals and whatnot, uh, to that are all, of course, non toxic to humans. They are toxic to, to rodents. So that's another plus an upside for cellulose, uh, keep, helps keep pest out. But, um, 
by densely packing all the cellulose insulation into these holes and uh, in, into these wall cavities, uh, you'll be able to create a high enough pretty much R value to retain uh, all the heat that you're paying for. Yep, that makes sense. And so, if anybody has any final questions, please feel free to type them into the chat box here. Um, and do you have any kind of final thoughts that you want to leave folks with? Um, well, I'm seeing, I guess, I don't know what the question is about, uh, is NIPA also working with municip municipal utilities as well? Um, I'm not sure what, what you mean in that type of regard, Caroline, but I mean, we do, uh, they, a lot of these municipal utilities are NIPA customers. We do provide them uh, electricity that they, they then give out to the residents in these municipalities. Um, so I know that's kind of the extent of my knowledge of how we work with uh, municipal utilities. Uh, but uh, if you're asking if we partner with municipal utilities on these workshops, we 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 do not. Okay. And seeing where we are time wise, I just want to say thank you very much, Matt, for your time today, and thank you to everybody for your participation. Um, again, our next webinar is going to be on greener cookware. That's on Tuesday, March 14th. There's a link in the chat there. Uh, so thank you very much, Matt. Fantastic presentation. And thank you everybody for your time today. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Have a good day.